Good morning, everybody. This is the Bible Live with Jeremiah. Um, I'm not so sure we're going to get too far today, but we're going to um, start Acts today. And with that, we need to get the Bible, of course. I tend to always start these things without the Bible in my hand. It's, it's a wonder we get anything done. Now, I enjoyed Mark. That's where we just came from. And I want to do the rest of the Gospels, but I want to make sure I also get Acts and Revelation done. Because that way you at least have one of the Gospels. Now, I, um, I like the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke better than the other two. It isn't that there's an um, emphasis on not liking the others. It's that with John, you get to see Christ before existence began. With Luke, you get to see Christ within all of us. And uh, all of our hope united in Christ. And it's beautiful. You see the family is what I mean to say. Like in Luke, when Jesus is on the cross, he tells John, his beloved disciple, Behold your mother, and to his mother, behold your son. I don't know what that was. But, um... So, coming to Acts, I'm going to read what is in this, uh, but before I do, Acts is an abridgment. Um, I don't really know how to describe it other than to say that it was specifically written to a specific person. Um, but it was to convey everything... Luke wrote the Gospel according to Luke, and that told whoever he was writing to about Jesus and the Gospel itself. And then Acts follows this as, as being almost entirely one letter, if not was one letter. And um, then it goes on to explain the ministry of the church, where the church began, uh, the, the laying on of hands, the first martyr being Stephen, um, the different directions between Paul and Peter, not directions like um, being given directions, but the paths they took. It, it shows us the highways and byways of the beginning of the church and um, how it grew and um, the spirit within working through the apostles. And <laughs> so I'll read this now. Title. This, okay, just just to explain. I am reading this stuff up here. This is what's in this Bible. Different Bibles have different kinds of commentary things, and I think it appropriate to, to read these in some cases. Um, those cases being where I'm not introducing the author themselves. I prefer to introduce the author. If you've uh, been with me in the later books, you'll see that I work backwards from Jude, but um, until we came to the Gospels. Except we skipped over Acts, and by accident I skipped over Romans. I didn't know I did that. I found that out today. But um, usually I introduce the author instead of the book to explain the way they see things, the way they perceive things, so that you can get the um, inferred meaning in what they're saying, the innate nature of their disposition. Um, it's like having a characteristic versus a characteristic when you have two different people side by side. They both observe the event from different angles. That's why all our Gospels are different. Um, now, Mark wasn't written by the eyewitness. Mark records what the eyewitness saw. But Matthew, Luke, and John, those are eyewitnesses. Well, no, actually, Luke is... Um, Luke, I, I don't know. I forget Luke. I hate to say something and be wrong on it. It's not like I don't do it, but... I prefer to be correct versus... Um, now, Luke, I believe, got his gospel, if I may be controversial, from Mary for a great deal of it. Um, let 
Okay, St. Luke, author, the third gospel is the first part of a two-volume work, including the Acts of the Apostles, from a second century tradition, um, quoting a canon. It is believed that the gospel was compiled by Luke the physician when after Christ's ascension, Paul had taken him to be with him. Luke is named by Paul as his companion in Philemon. And in 2 Timothy, in Colossians, he is called the beloved physician. So then we can correct my statement and say that Luke will have been writing as a... Uh, Paul's, um, I don't want to call it scribe, <laughs> um, Paul's helper. Uh, almost all the apostles had helpers, you know, a team of people behind them. Um, two by two is how Jesus sent them out. But in a lot of the cases with the apostles, not only do you have their churches, but you have people working with them going for, uh, the apostles would, would build this church they would leave people behind, they would train them up um, to know how to lead not to lead people but to lead according to the spirit in them according to what is good and holy and what is natural according to the Holy Spirit not according to us and the way we think and how we perceive things so it was very important to get the right kind of people if we were to, learn, if we were to turn to Timothy for example you'll see Paul giving <coughs> You'll see Paul giving the instructions to Timothy as to how to pick those people because Timothy is taking over the church as Paul moves on. Or, in whatever case, Timothy's basically taking over. And um, so the apostles would move around and they would set up the churches. They're preaching the gospel. And so wherever they preach the gospel, a family is born. A family of Christ is born and that would be called the church and usually when you see titles on the epistles it's the church of and that's what it means it means the family of let's say whatever city you're in so you go to that city and there's a church where the family of Christ gathers together and the people there this is going back to when the church was founded the people there would come together and their leaders will have been taught by the apostles or by somebody directly under the apostle and like I said they're not being taught to govern people the way that we perceive it today they're not being taught to be as the scripture says lords over the Lord's inheritance they're there as shepherds to help guide to help stir up the faith to help bring into remembrance the submission that we have to Christ and to build holy congregations so that as the apostles say um, I'm just going to use we here, which doesn't really include me, but we may give you to Christ blameless as a chaste virgin when Christ comes to be glorified in his saints. So that's the job of these churches. And um, in Acts, you will see that happening. You won't see it so directly, but you will now, uh, if you're paying attention to this introduction, you'll understand what's going on behind the background. It doesn't start out that way, but that's what's happening as we move along. Um, faith, in a sense, is born. Uh, it may be this one in particular that tells us, when thou art converted. When Jesus tells Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, I don't know if that's in the book of Acts. I don't know if that was in Luke or John. Uh, actually, I might be able to see it if it's in John right now. No, it's not John. Let me check. Jesus does speak in, in Acts. But let me look at Luke real quick, just in case. I like to give to you things that are in other books, if we can, if they don't take too long. Like when we did Mark, we went and we read um, Psalms 22.1. Eli, Eli, Sabach, Tanaim. My Lord, my Lord, why have thou forsaken me? Or... No. Luke is explaining by Christ's words. 
uh, in the book of Mark, you'll see that um, they explain very briefly. It's a very fast-paced book, but uh, toward the end, the very last chapter, I think it is, they tell us that there were that Jesus appeared to so and so and so and so and so and so. Well, in in Luke, you will see where they're by the seashore and it's the two walk or the two walking to some place, and Jesus appears to them, and he's walking with them, and they don't know who he is. And he's asking them why they're all upset. And they're like, are you a stranger that you don't know what has happened in Jerusalem? How that Jesus, who we thought was the Christ, was killed. And so <laughs> he's there. They don't know it's him. We're, we're told, actually, Mark, that he took another form. Uh, that he was seen in two different forms. And um, in that particular instance, it wasn't until they sat at meat to eat and he break the bread and um, basically praise the Lord that they realized who he was beautiful and we're told uh, somewhere not to um, I forget what it was anyway in speaking of faith we were told something and um, along the lines that buy it or charity or, or something probably charity but by whatever course they had entertained angels and I am now going because I'm curious now because I've forgotten what that was we're gonna get the concordance and we're gonna find that for you and it is uh, I can almost get it but let's look for entertain because I think that's what the word is now again I show it to you pretty much every time we um, get into these this is the Strong's concordance there are a couple other ones I like Strong's and if you need a concordance and uh, you can't afford them like this one I bought many years ago and it was um, $25 now that's not a lot for a book with this much priceless value but that was years ago I don't know what they cost now but if you need one Strong's the original is um, I forget what it's called copyright wise but you can download it for free and if you go to one of my websites I don't know what, what website names I have but um, I believe currently we're using the eternal gospel dot weebly dot com and at Bible resources or resources something like that you'll see that that is up there it's um, not open source but public domain that's what it is it's there you can get it and you can use it on your computer it's not a program but you could um, turn the pages manually um, just in case you need one now it may not be quite as extensive as these but it's still very nice to have and end enemies enter Yep, it's the only reference. And it is Hebrews 13.2. So entertained is one time in the Bible. And that was Hebrews 13.2. So, let's go turn there. Let brotherly love continue. That's the first sentence. I'm just kind of reading along. So let's start over. Chapter 13 of Hebrews. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bond with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in body. And, um... Be not carried about with divers strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary, by the high priest for sin 
are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So in this particular thing, we're, um, if you stuck around with me, you will see that I am constantly fighting what I call Luciferian doctrine, or what I call satanic. There's a big difference to me. Satanists are just selfish, or in the sense of um, self-minded, um, like an athlete, um, perfectionist. There's a big difference. Luciferians, uh, they worship the fallen angel Lucifer. Uh, whether they're aware of it or not, they worship the God of this world, as Jesus himself has called him, as the apostles have called him, and um, as Satan said, or as yeah, as Satan says, he has the power to give to whom he wills. And he says, "Bow down and worship me, and it's all yours." And so, what do you see celebrities doing? And what do you always hear them say? "I sold my soul to the devil." That's what they did. That's Luciferian, and it's all over Hollywood. It's all over your politicians. It's all over the world. United Nations is Luciferian, the CFR is Luciferian, the Freemasons are Luciferian. And the sad thing is, is there are so many people that don't even understand that. But then you also get all the people that are called conspiracy nuts. And um, they're demonized. You know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Because we're told there is one sin that is not forgiven. And while I am not pointing to that, I am stating that when Jesus said that, it follows with, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. In other words, they called what is holy, unholy. And we are warned uh, in James and Jude and Peter and John, all of them warn us. And I'm going to try to find in the last times. Oops, that's Revelation. I'm reading one. I'm just seeing if that's the right one or not. I will go ahead and read a bit of this. I don't think it's the, the one I was looking for. There is one where it's lovers of pleasures instead of, or lovers of self, lovers of pleasures, instead of lovers of truth and lovers of God. I think I added the God part, but lovers of truth. But in the book of Jude, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are, without water, carried about of winds, trees who fruit, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration, because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they, who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some, have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And now for that extra little point, we're going to go ahead and find that again in the Strong's Concordance. I forgot what I was looking for, so we might end up with something different. I have short-term memory, so I, I apologize. The way of truth shall be even evil spoken of. It's in Second Peter, and that particular one is Peter two, two Second Peter two two. I'm looking for lovers of themselves instead of lovers of truth. Be damned to believe not the truth. That is Second Thessalonians 2.12. So we will visit both of them. I will go with Thessalonians 2.12 first. Because I'll have a harder time seeing the T's when I uh, turn back to that. So. Oops. I did say second Thessalonian, right? Two and twelve. Okay, so backing up a little to catch up to this. We're going to start with the beginning of chapter 2. It's a lot that goes into this and exactly what we're talking about because we were talking about Luciferian doctrine and so this is perfect. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come 
except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he, he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And now to turn to Second Peter, I forgot what it was, 2-2. Two, 2-2. Two. Two, two. Okay. I'm going to back up into chapter 1 for this one, and then we'll jump right into chapter 2. I'm just trying to find a good starting point. Okay, I'm going to start with 112. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now moving into chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 
For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. We have not found what I believe I was looking for. So we did Jude and Peter. I'm going to search a little minute more and then we will move on. Or we may have already read it and I just forgot. Actually, I think what I'm looking for is a revelation. Well, in Galatians, we do have... Um, I only have part of the sentence here. But in Galatians, we have Paul talking to one of his churches... And he says, am I become an enemy now because I tell you the truth? Uh, because um, itching ears, that's what we're after. Itching ears. That's probably right there. It'd just be easier to do that. I try not to take up too much of your time, um, but I do want to spend some time in this. Everybody's going to die. Some point, someday, sometime. And my videos go on after I'm dead. That's the way I look at it. So I enjoy doing this. Because the day is going to come when all you have is that video and I'm no longer here. And I will have said my piece. People say I think of death too much. I don't think of death, I think of life. And I try to serve the betterment of life, not humanity. I'm not a humanitarian. I'm a person who believes in the soul. And the necessity for the soul to have life and that life in Christ. Which came first, the S or the T, because I got them backwards. Ooh, there's a lot of Israel. Second Timothy 4 3. And then we will move on to reading the introduction of Acts. Second Timothy 4 3. I know the T's are together, I just always get them backwards. Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus. So I think they're all together. Second Timothy fourth ring. Yes. Four three. We're gonna have to back up a little bit on this one too. But continue, okay, I'm starting in three, and then we'll move into four. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by interpretation of God, and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, moving now into chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. 
preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And so in both of those books right there, oops, now I'm just putting the Bible away. <laughs> but in both those books we had the same sort of connotation, if I have the right word, both Paul and Peter giving their departure speech and warning of the final days when we can just look at the church itself. I said it in the last, um, I think the last intro or the last outro. I think I did an outro on, it isn't separated from Mark chapter 16. After I finished the chapter, I spoke a little more. I think it's in that. But to me, most of the Christianity in this world is Luciferian. It doesn't at all acknowledge the Christ of God. It doesn't at all comprehend the power that's not in this world. What's in this world, what's in this reality is Lucifer. You can think of him as the greatest computer ever if you want to. The most intelligent source of everything that you want to. But it's all here. It's all trapped. It's inside a box. So we're all inside the box. And so is he. That's why he's called the all-seeing eye. A mockery of God is what it is. It's the most powerful angel inside existence. If you will accept that. And so you have him and his angels. And you have Christ who is from outside reality. Who has the power to come and go as he pleases. Well, actually, no, he doesn't. Because he doesn't get to come back until the Father sends him. So he can't even return. But Jesus has more power than Satan, more power than Lucifer, more power than anybody. His name, which we did not read that, is now higher than all the angels. It was from the beginning, from the very beginning because he was promised. Lucifer rebelled against that promise. And, um... Whew, sorry, I just lost my thought. Just that quick. It must be, yep. After a certain time. Um, I apologize. I don't mean to do this on camera. Anyway, I'll backtrack my thought a little and maybe that'll help us. Reality, and I do state it over and over because I'm convinced that 98% of humanity is either satanic or luciferian with or without their understanding. That 99% of the church called Christ, as in possession of, believes by confessing the name Christ with their mouth, but not with their heart, that they belong to him. They don't. They belong to the world that they're in love with. They belong to the things they want to buy, the things they want to have. They belong to this world. They've given up their souls as Satan offered them. He'd give them the world for their soul. And so many people do it, and it happens time and time again. And just because you backslide or you, you've fallen off the horse, you know, 
That doesn't make you satanic or luciferian. It just means that there's a lot more growing to take place in the spirit. We, we can't stop growing here. We can't. It's impossible. There's no end to Christ. He's eternal. But we're in a mortal form. So every time we fall, and don't quote Rasputin on me, because that is not what I'm talking about. Rasputin believed, and this is kind of the United Nations Luciferian doctrine, that you had to sin to gain the grace. And by the grace you gained more Christ-like exaltation. It doesn't work that way. We exist to serve God. Not to abuse grace. Not to mock the cross. The number one commandment we're told is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your understanding, all your strength, and all your life. And the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. And you see both mocked constantly in everything that is Luciferian. They use the cute little, little pretty words and persuade men this way and that. I would love to quote George Kirby right now in his infamous I'll call it speech on heroin. He has such a beautiful voice, it's kind of, if you don't know who he is, it's a little bit like, uh, not Darth Vader, but the gentleman who does Darth Vader's voice. I want to say Earl Jones, but that's close, it isn't right. James Earl Jones, I think is the name, that deep, resonating, sort of chamber of voice, and he's speaking about heroin and being the king. Not himself, but he's personifying heroin. Where I came from, nobody knows. I capture men's minds and souls. Something along those lines. It's awesome. Go look it up. And if you can't find it, I, I will try to make... I'll try to post that on my YouTube channel. Um... So by the time you see this, that'll be up there. But what were we after? We did the itching ears, we did that, that, the other thing. We were talking about the Luciferian Doctrine. And to explain the Luciferian Doctrine a little bit better, I can't call it a doctrine, but what it is, and it is closely relative to Satanism in the sense that they are two different things. Because Satanism is the gimmick of self. Luciferianism is a play, an illusion, a, 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 a misrepresentation of reality. So that while your mind is indeed plugged in to the illusion, you're paying attention to the magician's hands you're watching this and watching that and not seeing that. Kind of like the Monica, Monica Lewinsky case where Mr. Clinton was being, um, how shall we say it, impeached. But at the same time, on the other hand, was all the stuff with China and selling missile or um, defense secrets. Oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying he did. I'm saying, but while the media was focused on this, all this other stuff was taking place. And so he got to leave office. So casual and graceful, and everybody thought that it was only because of sexual expression. Not treason. As so many of the former presidents have been guilty of being treasonous presidents who sent men to die for their supporters, their backers, their owners, those who pull the strings for Lucifer. Now let us get this Bible and read the introduction to Acts. And uh, then we can move on from that.
So I'm reading again what is here. Title. The title as we know it was not attached to the original book but belongs to the second century AD. The Gospel of Luke and the Acts are two volumes of a single work and whatever title was originally prefixed to the Gospel served for both books. When the second volume began to circulate independently this title was used to designate its contents. Author. Neither the Gospel nor the Acts names their author, but he was most probably Luke, a friend and companion of Paul. The clue to authorship is provided by three we sections, where the narrative is in the first person plural, suggesting that the author was Paul's companion on these three occasions and is using his travel diary as his source. Some have suggested that this travel document was written by an unknown companion of Paul and incorporated into Acts by a later unknown author. But the uniformity of style between this travel narrative and the rest of Acts and the retention of the first person plural make this most unlikely. Church tradition uniformly identifies Luke as Paul's companion, and the data of the Acts supports this tradition. Date. The date of Acts is linked with the problem of its abrupt ending. We do not know when it was written, but a date shortly after the conclusion of the narrative is likely. If so, Acts was written about A.D. 62. Sources. Aside from his own travel diary, Luke may have used written sources, especially from the earlier chapters of his work, as a companion of Paul. He was in the position to gather first-hand information from the Apostle. Furthermore, since Luke was in Palestine during Paul's Caesarean imprisonment, he had ample opportunity to gather information about the early days of the church from eyewitnesses. Purpose Luke wrote to assure Theopolis, as to the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Uh, I said Theopolis. It's Theophilus. I'm not sure how to read the name, but Theophilus was probably a Gentile convert to Christianity, and Luke wrote to give him a greater knowledge of Christian origins. Then he already. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Luke wrote to give him a greater knowledge of Christian origins than he already possessed. This included the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Gospel, and the establishment and extension of the Church. Luke is telling a story, not writing a history. His story is that of the main outline of the extension of the Church from Jerusalem to Rome via Samaria, Antioch, Asia, and Europe. And in this story, only Peter and Paul played outstanding roles. This ministry of the other apostles elsewhere in the Eastern world was not important to Luke. Two themes underlie the story of this explanation. The rejection of the gospel by the Jews and its reception by the Gentiles. And the treatment of the early church by local Roman officials. Luke's main purpose, therefore, in his two-volume work, Luke and Acts, is to explain to Theophilus how it came about that the gospel which began with the promise of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel ended with the Gentile church in Rome distinct from Judaism. Furthermore, Judaism was a religion recognized by Rome. The new religious fellowship that arose within Judaism and yet was not simply a sect in the older religion, received the same recognition from Rome as did Judaism. Thus the Christian church became established in the Roman world as a legitimate religion distinct from Judaism. Ooh, that's a lot of wording. Um, I was pretty sure at some point somewhere that I had read that he had spent time with Mary as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know where I've read that from. But uh, so don't take that to 
to um, obviously 2,000 years ago I can't tell you everything and neither can anybody but there's a lot of people out there that think they can so that's our intro to Axe we're not going to start it today I've got to go places if I wake up in time it's uh, 3.30 I tried to wake up a little while ago and I tried to go to sleep a little while not a while ago neither worked um, oh and it's not the 22nd like I thought it was Okay. I'm pausing for a moment to think. I want to make one comment, and I hate to do something that I've already done because we just did it for Mark, but you're not going to be, I doubt you're going to do Mark than Axe as I'm doing. So, this is the Bible. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to go back to Eli, Eli, Sabak, and I in Psalms because toward the end we see the establishment of the church it's a Davidic Psalm and Christ was quoting it to let be known that this prophecy had taken place and so I will start it out my God my God why hast thou forsaken me? And this is Psalm 22. And I really encourage you to go read it. Now toward the end, uh, dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Talking about, well actually I'll just go right down to the next one. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones because he's able to see them all. He's completely unjointed. Uh, He's hanging on the cross, all his joints are out of place, and his head is in such a position that he can see every bone in his body. Pretty much. But then after this, um, But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword. Save me from the lion's mouth. I'm skipping ahead a bit just to get to this. And here it is. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Now in scripture he says, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he says, Those who do the will of God are my mother, are my brethren, are my sisters. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And we see, uh, also, it may also be this one, but God inherits the praises of his children. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Um, I would call that, I don't know how to interpret that, but for me, just for this moment, you see the centurion say when Christ cried with a great how you might say he gave up the ghost and the centurion is shocked now this centurion has seen crucifixion after crucifixion after crucifixion that's what they do that's how they punished the worst of the worst in Rome they crucified that's why everybody was afraid of them you never wanted to hear the word crucifixion. You hung on a cross until you died. And they scourged him beforehand. They beat him beforehand. It said somewhere that he's marred more than any man. So no one's been crucified like this man has been crucified. He's the king of the Jews. They had fun mocking him for that. The Jews wouldn't accept him. And the Romans thought it was the funniest thing because to them Jews might as well be dogs. They conquered them. They allowed the priests and so forth to do their things. But for the most part, Israel was still waiting for her promised kingdom. Her husband. So here he is. And they didn't know him. And he says, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of thee. And I'm going to quote this a little bit wrong. But it is, With their lips they honor me, but with their hearts they are far from me. 
Um, and somewhere it says, and he will basically take. It's just like the, the par not the parable of the fig tree, but on his way to Jerusalem, there's a fig tree. Now, figs have long represented Jerusalem or the Jewish faith. And there's a lot of numerology, actually, that goes along with fig trees and their fruitfulness and all sorts of similarities or similitudes. I have none of that in front of me that I could show to you, but like three days of darkness or something, how they ripen. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. The same thing with a the pearl. There's so much symbolism involved in it. How you get it, how it's cleansed, all that. But uh, moving on, walking toward Jerusalem with his, his disciples, he's hungry. Now let's put it in this terms. God sends, last of all, his son for the fruit of the vineyard. And they kill him and say he was the inheritor. So now that we've killed him, we own it. Well, here's the Son of God, hungry. He comes to the fig tree, and all that has is leaves. There's no fruit on it. Because the time, the season, for its fruit is not yet. Well, why not? Why isn't it yet? The in-season, out-of-season. Now, moving on. None can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. I'm going to jump back up. I've, I've skipped over a bit and we're going back to that. Um, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee for the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations all they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship all they that go down to the dust shall bow before him and none can keep alive his own soul. And I do that because while we are speaking of the Luciferian kingdom, you see, and we're told many times that first the wicked comes. In other words, before the kingdom of Christ, you have the kingdom of the wicked one, the son of Satan, or Lucifer himself, we don't know which, it depends on how you want to look at it, it doesn't matter. The son of perdition, the wicked one, whose ways are after Satan. And Jesus, when he says, and now the God of this world will come, he says, and he has nothing in me. No light. And yet he is called the light of the world. Lucifer, that is. They call him the light of the world. The intelligence of all intelligence. The brightest star in existence. It's delusion because man has been sent strong delusion that they may believe a lie Jesus says be ye not deceived behold I have told you all things so if you want to know all things just turn to the end of all the gospels or I think in Luke 21, maybe 19, somewhere in there, you'll see him talking about the end. And one thing I actually like in particular about the Gospels is that he makes it known that basically regardless of when he says he is showing up, no one knows. And that he doesn't know. So he warns us, you don't know in what wash Christ is returning. So be ye ready always. 
in season, out of season. Right now we can look around and see the Luciferian Empire building. We can see the United Nations, the CFR, we can see the Trilateral Commission, we can see all these things. We can see all of the strategies that have gone forth that I'm not even going to mention because we'd be here for a while. We've seen the dominoes. We've seen the way it's being set up. We've seen for oh, 200 years maybe this chess game. It makes me angry, but I'm excited for those who love Christ. I'm excited for them. But I'm angry at the world. I'm angry at the church. I'm angry at everyone who has ever confessed the name of Christ, but never known in their heart Christ. And I have no right to say that. But it is the truth about me. But as ye meet, so will you be judged. So for however many years I myself confessed the name of Christ, and didn't know him in my heart, I've got to be judged for that, because I just said that statement. Now, shall we move on now? I just, because it's such a book, you know? It's a long book. This is a long intro. I just want to make sure that we have enough uh, collateral criteria to strengthen what's being said, what's being reported. I think it's Isaiah or Ezekiel who says, who, has believe, who hath believed our report? I'm not going to look for that. Um, I think Paul says, because our report was believed, or our gospel was believed in that day. But, the one I wanted to to look at the, well, let's make two 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 statements. Um, I have to be careful how I word certain things because I can take them to a different. I don't want to say to a different dimension, but I I can certainly elevate the awareness of them. There are some things I need to keep not elevated because there is so much damage that would happen. Would would that be said? But I will say that there is a difference between Jews and bankers. Let's put it that way. Between the citizens of the sovereign state of Israel. Now Christians are told that they are New Israel. And we are shown in Revelation that New Israel is coming down. Or New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven the bride of Christ, or the bride adorned for her husband. Something along those lines. Uh, I would, I don't want to say it's not important enough to go look up, but, um, well, I guess we could. It won't take long. It's only a couple paragraphs. It's like Revelation 21. But it's mentioned a couple times. But in Revelation, you also see the Luciferian Empire. You see the different beasts, um, the dragon, the whore of Babylon, don't get lost in that. I'll tell you this since I brought it up. One of the problems with satanic Christians, those who worship their own understandings, their own intelligence, as we are warned not to brag, because nothing that we have been given, if we've been given it, is something that we own. It was given by the Holy Spirit. So for anybody out there worshipping their own intelligence, bragging about how intelligent they are, how much they know or think they know, be very careful. Just like you're warned in prayer, to tread carefully in prayer. Because of the words we say. Uh, one of the things almost every Christian has done because we were Gentiles is put the fist to God and say, why, why, and cry like babies. I've done it, and I don't know how many times I've done that. Uh, most of my life I was like that. Suffer this, suffer that. Hold the faith, hold the faith, suffer, hold the faith, suffer. And finally you have enough, your nerves have had enough, and you start screaming, why? 
and then after you go through the fire and go through it and go through it and go through it and realize just how meaningless your own life is you come to realize that you have no life you don't have life you don't have life and you don't have life and your life if it all exists is in Christ and if it all it shall exist is in Christ making everything including your body your words your mind and your heart fake it's all the same substance dried up by the sun dead tomorrow back in the ground it goes but what goes to God Jesus says out of the heart a man defiles himself out of the heart come murders and sins and transgressions out of the heart the mouth doth speak and we're told that is the treasure that where the treasure is there will the heart be also so when you find your life you lose it when you lose your life you find it because the only place it can exist is in your heart it's not in your job it's not in your day it's not in the world around you any life that you truly have is not this body but the heart of hearts and that is not of this world unless you have made this world the substance on which your heart thrives now turning to Revelation and it isn't chapter 21 it is chapter 22 and the spirit and the bride say come and let him that heareth say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of this of the book of this prophecy God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book he which testifieth these things saith surely I come quickly amen even so come Lord Jesus the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen and now moving up to this then saith he unto me see thou do it not oops sorry I skipped one it's right here I just missed it a little bit I might have been right it is in 21 but we'll read this first And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the first and the last blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And now moving over. I don't want to read all of it, but uh, New Jerusalem. Well, you know what, to just really close this off, in case this might be the only book 
that you spend time in. Um, we're going to go ahead and read chapter 21 of Revelation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there were no more sea, which is to say man. No more man, no more genealogies, no more genetics, DNA, so forth. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We are going to go ahead and um, skip the rest of this. Just want, uh, just want to... Okay, I will read a little bit more. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And uh, leaving the rest of all that which describes it alone, we will turn over to here and we see, uh, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold. And it were trans as it were transparent glass, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into anything that de and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that book is really the whole point of the book of Acts. The book of the book of life. The Lamb's book of life. Which is the blood um, that we read earlier. I think that was in Psalms. But that is uh, that's a long introduction. It's a lot for you to, uh, to digest. And um, I think it's truly sufficient to really help emphasize any sort of points in the book of Acts that might be a little confusing or seem a little off. Um, take note, though, that the ministry of Christ started with the Jews. That was always the point. It had to go to them first. After Christ's resurrection, forgive me, 
it was first preached to the Jews. And I'm not saying all the Jews turned it down. The first disciples are Jews. Christ is a Jew. Um, the apostles were Jews. And the first churches were Jewish. But they were persecuted. Constantly persecuted. Hated. It, it would be like... Um, say you own a family business. And you sell a certain product. And right next door, one of your family members makes a whole other business that sells the same product with a different label or something of the sort. And now it's kind of like a competition in your eyes. It feels like they betrayed your family. That's sort of the way the Jews saw it. That these were evil people. That they denied the faith of the Jews. And they went and tried to spread this other product. As if it were the original. It's not an improved recipe, you might say. It's it, the, the Jews thought they had the right one, just like all religions do. But here we're offered life, and life freely, and life from God, the eternal, the beginning and the end. Um, spend time thinking about that. The beginning and the end. In one of the books that I wrote, I called that the beginning was the Word of God. The end is the glory of God because the glory of God has the power to accomplish. The Word began. The glory accomplishes. As if it's all one equation. It's like math starts at the beginning and when the sentence is finished, it's accomplished. And so when we see it is done, that equation is done. So regardless of how many millions of calculations are involved, different chances or happenstances or uh, observations, whatever is compactly involved in whatever it is that is accomplished, that's done, and it's all one equation. So think of the beginning and the end. Because Lucifer doesn't have that power. He's not the beginning and he's not the end. He's just the man in the middle here to tempt us, and even Jesus had to go through that temptation. Being led by the Spirit, he was tempted of the devil forty days, and the devil left him for a season, and then he returned when Jesus is at his day. That night when his soul is so full of pain that he's almost dead, that he could die from the pain in his soul. There's Satan to mock him. When he's on the cross, surrounded by all these mockers, there's Satan. Come down off the cross if you are the Son of God. Himself trusted in God, why can't he save himself? Satan was there the whole time. And he was in that crowd. Everybody that beat him, everybody that spit on him, everybody that denied him is Satan. Think about that. In the hacking world, it's called the man in the middle attack. Social engineering. Lucifer is a social engineer. He's a showman, and a liar, and a murderer. He pretends to be what he is not. But Christ is the beginning, and Christ is the end. And when we say end, we mean the end of everything that is now, and eternity. He is the reward to those who overcome this world. He's the reward. And he is the adoption. He's the adoption of our soul to God in Christ. There are so many false prophets out there saying that there are many ways to God. You don't get to God 
Nobody goes to God. No man has ever come forth from God except Christ. And no man goes back to God except Christ. And nothing that is defiled may enter God. But Christ is perfect, and we are made perfect in Christ. So that he may take us to the Father. As a matter of fact, we will make that one last point. I usually have trouble finding this one. And last of all, the Son also shall be in subjection, I think is the word. So hopefully we have it right. Oh, there's a lot in Hebrew. I can quote a little bit of this. Uh, basically, in Hebrews, it talks about the name of Christ. And it says that God didn't put any angel in charge of the world to come. But, um... Thus put all things in subjection under him. And that he put all in subjection under him. He himself is excluded, being God. That might be where I need to go. and the powers being made subject unto him. And the church is subject unto Christ. There it is. It is 1 Corinthians 15, 28. The Son also himself be subject unto him. So let's turn to that. 1 Corinthians... 1528. It's very important. We might spend a little time with that Hebrews thing and then we should be done. Okay. Well, I might be able to turn to the Peter one right now. That was, um. Ooh, I forgot what that one was. I want Peter that was Hebrews. That's two. Okay, yeah, we'll read a little bit of chapter 2 in Hebrews. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, when divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. And to make a mark here, we're reminded that Noah, um, that there were eight souls saved with Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness, and there were eight souls in the ark with him. And um, that's in another chapter, I think that's with Peter. Uh, there's, there's two spots in the New Testament that I'm aware of that speak about the angels being judged. Um, one of them is, Know ye not that we shall judge angels, but that's not quite the same one, I don't think. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And in the next statement it's saying, But God is exempt to this because he's the one who gave him everything. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. 
but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying I will declare thy name unto my brethren again this is Psalms 22 I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee and again I will put my trust in him and again behold I and the children which God hath given me and here's what I was talking about for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath, that had the power of death, that is the devil, and and deliver them who through fear and death, who through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Okay, what I was speaking of was not actually here. It must be in the other one. But, um, because I forgot what I was going to say. There is a sentence up here. To destroy the works of the... Um, there is a scripture that says... Uh, Christ was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. So I want to make that clear. There's a clear distinction because Luciferians try to teach that they're nearly the same person. That's that's not at all true. We've already read, I make all things new. I don't know if we read the part where it says, yeah, um, the former things are past. Um, the last enemy is death. But you see right here and in the section where it says... Um, he was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And I'll read that one in a minute. But let's jump to this so that we can get out of this and let you guys go. We were after... 1 Corinthians 15.28 Okay, 15... This is so awesome. <laughs> but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign remember that he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be de de ugh. the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death for he hath put all things under his feet this is the one I was talking about but when he saith all things are put under him it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him in other words God is not under Christ Christ is under God but God has put all things under Christ including Lucifer oh shoot And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be in all, that God may be all in all. See, that's the thing you hear spiritual people talk, or not spiritual people, but spiritualism say all the time, that everything is God. No, that's what is going to happen. When all, let me, let me repeat that. And when all things shall be subdued, 
unto him, being Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him. Remember, Christ is the author and the finisher. He created all things. So when all these things are then subdued, once more, because he came to find that which was lost, um, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Why are you calling yourself a Christian, basically, if you don't believe this? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. He dies daily because he believes this. This is, uh, I believe, Paul's writing. And he's constantly trying to remind the church. I've got to hurry up. My, I've got to get medicine in me. Um, he's constantly reminding the church who is over them. And reminding them that these apostles serve them and Christ. And he, he keeps finding redundancies. Carnal people in the churches. Carnal sermons. Uh, one thing with the apostles is they have people coming and going constantly. You know, letting them know what's going on in the churches. There's, you know, perhaps reports even. Maybe somebody, let me, what was that scripture? manifest to take away or to destroy the works of the devil. Oh, I've got to hurry up. I'm looking for destroy. I think that'll be a quicker way to find it. There's a lot of destroy in the New Testament, but it's uh, pretty specific. Okay, 1 John 3, 8. That he might destroy the works of the devil. I'm going to turn there, and we're going to finish this up. 1 John 3, 8. Trying to get my mind back. I think that's before this book. James John. James John. James John. I can't think. Okay, I'm going to read chapter 3 for a minute and then we're going to finish this. This is 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth, knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now, we are, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I apologize. I'm not trying to be so horrible with this. Uh, I'll, I'll reread the second one. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, speaking of the form, the body that the soul will have. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that means to see him as he truly is, not as these eyes would see him, regardless of whatever lights or, you know, whatever show we might see with these eyes, we would see truth, because he is truth. So we're going to put on truth. When it says we put on incorruptible, it means we're putting on truth. This world is a lie, and Christ is the truth. 
and we're told that they they love not the truth, and that's why they were destroyed. That's why they brought on themselves damnation. They love not the truth. Christ is the truth. We're going to put on the truth, the truth of God. Um, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses, I have to say transgresses because I can't say the other one, also the law for the sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. In him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And that doesn't mean a little itty bitty sin. That means to say your lifestyle, your life, you've decided to deny him. That's basically what it means. We have this hope in Christ. But instead of that hope in Christ, people turn every which way. Oh, goodness, now we're going to have to read that one. <laughs> I've, I meant to read that one anyone. Everybody makes excuses. Uh, but I do have to be quick. I, I get migraines and my eyes get fuzzy. I can't read. I get tongue-tied all at the same time. Um, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin. And again, see the separation here. They are not the same people, Lucifer and Christ. They're not the same. The Luciferians want to put them on the same plate. They're not. Lucifer is from reality. Christ is from God. Literally from God. His life is inseparable from God. The true God. The God that is pure and perfect and nothing unholy can touch him, in whom is no darkness at all. That's why Christ was resurrected. There's no darkness in him. Whew. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, the Holy Spirit, remaineth in him, and he cannot seed, be, cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Again, there is a difference and a division. Whosoever do, doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Now there's two ways of looking at that, and it's arguable depending on how you want to look at it. Cain can be called the literal child of the devil, as in genetically. Um, it is the possibility that in the seduction, and I'm not pointing to Arnold Murray particularly, but he, he, he carries this point. Um, that Eve would have been wholly seduced, or shall we say sexually seduced, and we do know that DNA and genetics run abroad throughout the scriptures. So I'm saying it is a possibility that's what it means. We know that the Watchers had children with the women of man. And um, in the book of Enoch, those children, when they became wicked, were punished of God. They basically destroyed the world in a sense, were cannibals. Um, the Watchers came down in the book of Enoch and taught men the things they weren't supposed to know and changed the course of man the same as uh, in, in their book they say a name of one of them that, divide, that um, um, beguiled Eve and uh, that's the book of Enoch that's separate from these scriptures I think at one time it may have been a part of it I don't remember uh, 
it's quoted in Jude. I think it's quoted twice in the Bible. I'm not specific on that. And you can find that book on my website. You can also, if you have the computer available, you can um, look for Robert Farrell. He does an audio narration of the Book of Enoch. And you can get it on YouTube or uh, directly from his website. And I forget what it's called, but I think it's The Sacred Truth. But just look for Robert Farrell and Book of Enoch and you'll find that. And you can also find that either linked on my website or put up on my website. I don't know. But, um, I have to hurry up with whatever I was reading. Okay, I was saying that, um, Cain is called the son of the devil, but we also know that Christ, when he was speaking to the Jews, and he was defending himself, I really don't want to read so much scripture, um, it isn't that I don't want to read scriptures that right now I'm becoming incapable of reading it. But, uh... To try to get it in perspective, they said we have one God, even... Basically, their God is the God of Abraham. Or one Father, something along those lines. And he says no, because if you were basically the sons of Abraham, then would you love me? Because Abraham loved me, sought me, looked for this day and was glad. He said, no, your father is the devil. And it's a little bit of a lengthy um, interaction. I might read that one to you. What was that last one that we were going to do? I'm trying not to be selfish here, but I, I, I don't like to be incoherent while doing these videos either. But to put back into perspective in chapter 2 of John we see little children it is the last time as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come even now are there many Antichrist whereby we know that it is the last time. Whosoever denieth the Son the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize because the world's trying to seduce you right now. The churches, many of them have already fallen to it. Um, Christ says you can't worship money and God too. It doesn't happen. The mind will worship money, it will worship things, and the heart can be made to love money. But it's meant to to love God. It was born to love God. The heart and the soul were meant to be alive in God. That's why we're given this promise. That's what was lost. It wasn't this body, it wasn't this mind. It was our heart and soul's life in God. And what did we gain when we lost that? The works of the devil. The God of this world. Excuses. That's what we were after. Oops, I went the wrong way. Oh, exalt. Execution. Oops. Okay, that would be Luke 14, 18. So we will turn to that, and that should finish this up. I thought I, thought I was in the Gospel of John. 
Oh man, when my mind goes, it goes. Fourteen. Eighteen. Now this is very important. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And he went through the cities. Oops. <laughs> I started a little too far ahead. My fault. I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm really sorry I get like this and my mind stops working right. And it happened at the wrong time. Okay. I'll just read from the beginning of 14. This is Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, like there's another Luke in the Bible. Okay, I'm sorry. Here we go. Starting at chapter 14. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him, and healed him, and let him go. And answering them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit, and will not straightway pull him out of the sa pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. In other words, called. We're told that we're called. So remember that this is Jesus speaking about being called to the kingdom of God, called to serve Christ, called to be with him, called to that day, that revelation, that reward, the eternal day, past all this flesh. Beyond all of this, we're called to what's on the other side of Alpha and Omega. We're called to his new name. Right now, he's called Alpha and Omega. In the book of Revelation, we're told he has a new name. And you might as well call it the Eternal. Because that whatever his name is, that's what it is. It is eternal. And it is the righteousness of God, the excellency of God, the love of God, all that God is will be in Jesus and we in him and God all in all. And here is what he is saying about it. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out of the chief room saying unto them when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding sit not down in the highest room lest the more honorable man than thou be bidden of him and he that bade thee and him come and him that bade thee and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither the kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them sat at meat with him, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. 
The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. I'm just trying to see if there's more to this. I think a little bit. You'll have to infer it, though. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and the Lord tells us many times that we have a cross, <laughs> and whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply, by chance, lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace? So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, I would call this the heart and soul, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Because they're supposed to have faith and hope in Christ. And if they lose that, how do you repair it? That's the greatest challenge we face is maintaining and overcoming and enduring and contending keeping the faith in our heart alive as Timothy is told to fan the flames wherewith shall it be seasoned it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill but men cast it out he that hath ears to hear let him hear so we have covered a great deal I feel like it's probably been an hour and a half but for this particular book, it's, it's quite important. I'm not even going to bother trying to remember what that last scripture was. I do recall it now. It was um, when they were speaking about who their father was, Abraham, God, and Jesus said that the devil was their father. So making that point again to Cain, um, you see Christ many times rebuking. And when it comes to his disciples... Remember, these are people who walk with him, who are learning with him, who have spent the years with him, who have spent years with him. When they rebuke him, remember he said there's one unforgivable sin. When they rebuke him, he says, get behind me, Satan. Because they're trying to prevent him from doing the will of God. They're trying to prevent him from being righteousness incarnate. They're trying to prevent him from preventing Satan. He's here to destroy the works of the devil. For that purpose came he into this world. 
for that purpose God sent him forth to destroy the works of the devil so when his disciples challenge him and provoke him to anger it's because they're trying to keep him the excellency of God from contending with Satan righteousness against iniquity something no mortal man can do but Jesus can so in those moments they're denying the entire purpose for his mortal incarnation incarnation and he turns to them and he calls them Satan which is the same thing he's saying of um, the same thing the apostles say of Cain Cain is the child of the devil and um, Abel is righteous for his sacrifices to God and the people contending Jesus he calls them the children of the devil that the devil is a murderer from the beginning and a liar from the beginning and when he says there is one unforgivable sin it's because they say um, I think it's because they say he hath a devil what it was was one of the Pharisees or somebody a high priest somebody came up and said this was after he was casting out devils he says I think it goes, he hath a devil, and by the power of Beelzebub doth he cast out devils. And after Jesus says, how does that even logically make any sense? Because if Satan casts out Satan, how can he stand? If he sends an army and then pulls it back, there's no one to hold the land. So if uh, Satan were to take over a plateau and put his flag up and pull his people out and pull the flag up who's holding it Jesus says he has an end he doesn't own it anymore so why would he cast his own devils out now he might make a show and pretend like he's casting them out but he's not truly going to cast them out so with all of that said I hope you appreciate this video um I do all of these live as in, I don't premeditate this stuff. It's just, we go with the flow. I try to do that to prepare myself um, for the opportunities when I need to talk to somebody or, uh, you know, if people have questions. That way it's not pre-rehearsed. It's, you know, it's on the spot. It's, uh, how's the saying go, Johnny on the fly? I don't know. But anyway check you guys later and um, we will start act soon and this is the end for tonight it's definitely been over an hour all right everybody this is Bible live with Jeremiah um, currently the website being used is the eternal gospel and um, that's with the word the at the beginning and then eternal right after so there's two e's the eternal gospel dot weebly dot com and you'll see the videos there you'll also find them on YouTube so you can look them up on YouTube you can look them up on the website there's a lot more with the website that you can you know sort through there's several different kinds of websites but we'll see you guys later and God bless everybody that's with us in Christ